I decided to discuss the first five years of life following the thread of superego. You can, you can study the first five years of life uh, along any thread of development you'd like. Um, but this is a particularly interesting one because you have to cover all of development, which is very useful. Superego development in the first five years of life pulls in everything, every theorist and every neuroscientist's uh, opinion about childhood. And you could study it along object relations lines, or you could study it, you know, along brain development and cognition. You could study it along the development of the self. But if you study conscience development, then you get to teach the whole first five years. Uh, so this is going to be uh, markedly uh, sketchy since I am covering all those aspects, just talking about conscience. Uh, to begin with, superego in uh, psychoanalytic parlance is our word for conscience. And they're not exactly parallel, but if you're talking to residents and you're talking uh, to families, conscience makes more sense. Uh, but uh, I will use the term subrigo uh, interchangeably with conscience. And just as ego is in a general way the psychoanalytic word for our adaptive capacities, uh, the neuroscientists would say that uh, ego, shmigo, it's brain. Uh, but in fact, we think of ego in a more psych a meta-psychological way. It isn't just brain. The ego is a synthesizer between inside and outside. But it's fair enough to use the term when you're teaching as the adaptive capacity. I'm going to use the word ego. The parameters we can use to track developments, as I say, of the young child through the early phases, um, we can use any concept we want. I'll pull in cognition, object relationships, uh, particularly when I get to adolescence. The guider, uh, we can draw in um, the sense of development, which we tend to clump under ego development. Uh, the odd man out in the structural model, if you would call the structural model, was Freud's third model, and it sort of included the old topographic conscious, pre-conscious, unconscious, but it includes the structures of ego in id, you can't teach using the word id anymore. It doesn't wash. You need to use the word drive when you teach medical students. Um, and superego. So we're, we're going to talk probably in terms of the structural model. Um, so the odd man out in this model thus far in my discussion is drive, <coughs> id, uh, which develops two and I'm not going to go into that deeply, or we won't do this in another one. Uh, today we will trace superego development as a separate line in a structural model in order to better understand not just conscience development, but the defining events and personality uh, that occur in this space from birth to five years. One could say there is only ego and drive in this model, since the superego, how do you think it got the name superego? Uh, it's certainly part of our adaptive capacities. If you don't develop a superego, you will not fit. And it grows out of ego. It's in an effort to adapt. Uh, and become, it becomes the agency that makes it possible, you know, the ego's agency, initially, uh, that insists on socialized behavior and delayed or even sublimated drag gratification. Super ego, mm, I'm not sure. It's often not very super, and sometimes it interferes quite dreadfully with our reasonable gratification of our drives. Uh, it can go awry and become quite sadistic. It can often uh, make the job the ego has, the nice neutral job, of adapting us to reality and still getting uh, what Pla 
measures we can for our drives. Uh, the superego is not all the ego's adaption to society and being a good citizen. Uh, as it turns out, it seems to have a life of its own, a drive of its own. Uh, conceptually, uh, our ideals, uh, let me skip it, the superego is not all ego adaption. Often it is imbued uh, with considerable aggression from its own drive and even sadism. Uh, it also has enough of its own libidinal energy that we would hope that it becomes the loving and beloved superego that praises us for doing the right thing. Uh, conceptually, our ideals get embedded in conscience or superego. Uh, Peter Blow Sr.'s book, Son and Father, a very interesting book about ego ideals uh, and the evolution from the child's tender, uh, homosexually tinged, negative Oedipal relationship with the same-sex parent early in life. Uh, these are very interesting and important ideas uh, that we might take up this afternoon when we discuss mm -hmm. puberty and early adolescence. Uh, if we like, we could talk about evil idea. But certainly, conceptually, when you're talking to people, you tend to group in this conscience uh, ideal behaviors for gratification versus prohibitions. Uh, the origin and uh, workability uh, of our ideals frequently does not get analyzed during clinical work with grown-ups. Uh, and the origins are very important to study and not, not well understood by lots of analysts. And, and maybe we can talk more about that if you'd like. Uh, we'll take up the ego ideal later. Um, during the discussion of adolescence, uh, we think in terms of the final resolution of the ego ideal. In any case, as an amalgam of ego adaptions to the outside um, demands, in some drive in the form of aggression and sadism, among other things, ideals based on negative ethical resolution and a great many identifications interjects and internalizations of values of those who mothered and fathered the children, uh, we have uh, what we would call superego. The study of conscience development could be a huge and mightily important study. Indeed it is. It would, if we undertook this study, remember, it would pull in object relations theory, self-psychology, relational theories, uh, classic psych psychoanalytic development, developmental theory, and all the neurosciences. However, today I want to talk <coughs> about the practical aspects of building a conscience from the ground up, from zero to five years. My interest in this age group has always been there as an analyst for children, adolescents, <laughs> and adults. We have always known uh, that the basic structure of character, I use the term interchangeably with personality, uh, begins in these first years. The basic building blocks for character structure are set in place in these early years. And while events and latency, and we'll discuss the, the term this afternoon, what is, what is this latency, but events in the elementary school years in adolescence can be quite definitive in personality outcome. It's these early building blocks that if they are laid down crooked and deformed, the later structure will tend to sway and tip in the wind of stress, no matter how straight the building appears above ground. Uh, so this it's critical what happens with these building blocks. Uh, my interest has been particularly peaked by my work at Allen Creek, the psychoanalytic nursery school in Ann Arbor, where I come from today, uh, and by my consultations with the families and the small children from the nursery. Um, this is a program where we start with groups for pregnant mothers, 
and they get a chance to discuss their their dreams and hopes and projections onto their babies. We have groups for um, the babies and their mothers, where teachers, psychoanalysts, uh, talk about queuing into babies. And we have uh, groups that we call the cruiser crawler. It, it, actually, it's a, you really have to establish a different group once the kids are moving because they are so intrigued with each other and the beginnings of object relations make them so different from the babies in arms. Uh, so we have the cruiser crawler groups, then we have a first year uh, toddler group where you have a parent, usually the mom, uh, with a child that's usually up and walking from the cruiser crawler group to the age of two, and then we have a senior toddler group from two-ish to three-ish, and it's not till three-ish, and we can talk about why that is if people are curious, that we have them separated from their moms long enough to enjoy a teacher, not a servant, parent servant, but a teacher uh, for two and a half or three hours a day in the nursery school. And then of course we have the four to five year old nursery where uh, it feels like we have very evolved children who make real close ties with each other and prepare for, to become school children. Um, well, this conscience development begins with the earliest attachment and supposedly ends with adolescent closure. But adult life, too, brings <coughs> additions and changes in values and self-generated prohibitions. Many people's superegos never have the independence from group pressure about what is really wrong to do or the uh, solidity of conscience that keeps them from turning a blind eye to what is wrong, as we well know. In general, if the basic structure of the superego is not laid down straight in the first five years of life, it really can never be put quite right. And that's a pretty radical statement, but I would say that most theorists and then people very practically involved with children would agree with me. Uh, the superego turns out to be a flexible organ, somewhat, and it, it evolves into tremendous, tremendous shades of gray. I mean, clearly more voluminous. Become more layered and sophisticated uh, with later development. Um, for a long time, we can doubt our own certainty about what is right and wrong uh, and compare it and be swayed by the opinions of those around us, uh, particularly in adolescence. And at times, superego super seems almost dissolvable in the group's psychology. Um, very interesting literature on that, uh, particularly in adolescence, when everything is in flux, as I'll talk about this afternoon, or later this morning. But ask a five-year-old, ask a five-year-old what should happen to the child who took the teacher's pencil. And he will quake and worry that the child might be imprisoned for theft, sort of Ali miserable. Ask the same child at the age of nine what should happen to the child who took the teacher's pencil. And he's quite likely to say, you know, he ought to put it back. He shouldn't take the teacher's pencil. You can see the tremendous change from this very concrete organ to one of greater sophistication. Um, one learns that some transgressions are worse than others. Okay, so we see nuclei from infancy uh, of superego development. And this is most important, and it's why centers like this and the dissemination of knowledge is so critical, because it can't be undone easily and sometimes never. Uh, we see nuclei uh, as early as a few months. Uh, the mirroring uh, it, it, of the mother who attends to the child uh, 
and it tends to the child's cues, which is what we teach, uh, to keep the maternal and child dyad uh, in tune. Uh, the mirroring that says to this infant, you are valuable and you are good, is a critical underpinning to uh, the superego development. So we have groups of pregnant mothers who share with us their fantasies and their projections of their babies to be and their concerns regarding their own mothering. Their narcissistic investment in producing this miracle must be nearly total. Objectivity about the baby comes later, as the two hatch from this oneness. Uh, this mirroring function and the good interaction of you are good and valuable uh, is critical as the child begins to distinguish self from other. As early as seven months, I'd say even earlier observing, uh, the child looks to the mother's uh, affective expression when it's hesitant. And you see the babies being hesitant. Uh, and the question in that baby's eyes is clearly, is it safe in the developing trust and dependency? By nine months, certainly by nine months, there's some capacity to understand prohibitions and commands. Now, they can't do much about them, but they get it. They already get it. Um, and you can see in their eyes the question, is that an hour? Um, the quality of this early relationship with the mothering person is central. Not just to everything, but today we're talking about superego development. There's no love, there's no pleasure, <clears throat> and no attending to mother's prohibitions and wanting that smile back and the building blocks are going around. Walking has an effect on superior development uh, because by 14 to 18 months, the toddler becomes willful. Uh, he's practicing boundaries and autonomy with great negation. No is his favorite word. You want ice cream? No. Uh, and it, it's internalizing the responses of the parent at this point, hand over fist, so to speak. Uh, and of course, very clever moms who are not threatened by this negation and the beginning sadistic teasing realize that, at least for now, the child's very distractible. You can change the subject with a new toy. Um, the prohibiting interjects are colored, of course, by the temperament uh, of the child, the stress uh, that is in the air, um, and of course the very low frustration of the child at the time. Um, if there's no loving aspects, the primitive, aggressive, and easily projected anger and threats are retained and interjected, and much magnified. I mean, what happens around the child it's not directly reported inside. The child makes whatever he's going to make of it in the best intention parents, quivering with guilt, and say, did my cross word or bad day cause this? No, the child's working through his own filter, obviously. In the second year, uh, if the 18-month reproachment problems are severe, the child's view of the parent as ideal as the compromise. Uh, if the parent has been harsh or scary or gone, uh, the, the necessary idealization of the parents, the one is going to take inside, uh, is very much jeopardized. It takes, you have to let idealization go away slowly. And the final de-idealization, de of course, will be in adolescence where the adolescent has to de-idealize himself. We all have feet of clay, that's okay. But a tiny child can't. So, the toddler, if the toddler has an angry and sadistic response um, to his mother's uh, limits, uh, much of it is internalized as introjects. By the age of two at least, he knows mother and he well, he knows this by 16, 18 months, that he and mother have two different agendas. 
you know, he's thinking, I want what I want. She doesn't want me to have it. And ambivalence rears its difficult head. Now, what is ambivalence? I tend to think of it as a child analyst is starting during this period, 18 months, 42-ish, where you learn the very difficult task of loving and hating the same person. Um, now, the problem in the Tyler group is that they cognitively uh, certainly don't have a handle on being able to love and hate the same person. If they are hating the mother for saying, you may not clobber Billy with the truck, they hate their mother at the moment. But the teachers help the mothers learn to say, I know you're mad at me now, but remember we had a good time this morning, and we will have a good time later at the park. They literally need to be reminded and, and gradually come to tolerate their rage. Because they are reminded that you can hold two feelings about the same person. A tremendous achievement in human life, this resolution of ambivalence, relative resolution of ambivalence, which is supposed to occur by object constancy. That's what object constancy kind of is, among other things. Uh, it's being able to love and hate the same person. Um, so during this time when they're struggling with their ambivalence, they are a handful. They tease. They're sadistic, they're mad, uh, and of course passionately loving when they feel loved and unprohibited. Uh, omnipotence is waning, uh, they get a little more fearful, uh, and their self-esteem still rests on the approval of pretty idealized parents. I see all the ambivalence of this teasing, sadistic toddler and the various responsive responses of parents as they try to control their own sadism. It's something that parents come to learn, is that every phase their child goes through gets them back in touch. If they're really cued in and allow a little aggression in themselves, gets them a little in touch with what happened to them during that time period. Um, Tatters. Interesting enough, at this age, can't tell if they're angry uh, or if the parents or teachers are angry. Uh, they can't tell yet inside and outside. So it takes a great deal of support, these early internalizations. Uh, Trevor, a 22 month old child in our uh, toddler group, grabbed another child's toy. The teacher and mother rushed to say no, but there were other trucks that he could play with. But this one for now was Ben's, and he would have to wait his turn. Much screaming and crying ensued. The upset seemed generally confusing, till he began screaming, no, 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 no. Unsure if he was ashamed or if he feared retaliation from without, um, he was held and soothed. He calmed at once when it was explained that he had a big, I want it feeling, and he would learn to ask first in time. He might want to look at the other trucks now, till Ben was done playing with the red one. Other age mates clung to their mothers and checked their mothers' faces to see who was angry. The truck was, was, of course, returned to Ben. It was not yet Trevor's turn. This early superego anxiety is fierce, and the need arises to tone it down. Uh, their self-criticisms are irrational and destructive, and they learn how they must learn how to forgive their own mistakes and make up for wrongdoings. Not out of force, say you're sorry, not that kind of thing, but get the ice pack until the other child, you know, feels better. Help me repair this, is what they learn, and it adds to their self-esteem. 
um, by tuning ever so. The child minds prohibitions, mostly if the parent is there. Uh, resolve to behave oneself melts quickly in the absence of the mother or the parent. Um, this is my donut example. But if the mother puts donuts or the father puts donuts on the kitchen table and says to the toddler, the older toddler, don't touch the donuts. They're for after dinner. Uh, and then leaves the room to change the laundry you would be around. Uh, the two and a half year old may very well uh, respect the prohibition. But the parent maybe doesn't want to be gone too long because after a while the toddler's going to ease up to those cinnamon donuts and you're going to see him start with is he in going, no, 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 no. And if mother doesn't get back, he probably will take a donut. <laughs> um, it implies that structures are present, but they're pretty weak. Uh, interjects are just beginning to become the voice of authority. Uh, for three weeks, three-year-old James walked into our first year preschool. He now didn't have his mom with him. And James walked in muttering, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. I'm sure his, his beloved parents who had tried so hard to be perfect would have been mortified. Uh, but he, he was working on inside, outside. Uh, and when pressed by his teacher, uh, it turns out that he had done some transgressions like pull the cat's tail and wet his paints and growers. That's a grocery store. Mm -hmm. And he reminded, he was reminded that these were mistakes and he would feel better about himself when he could be kind to the cat and when he could tell mom when he needed to go uh, to the bathroom. So he gradually stopped muttering, brightened, and got less aggressive with the other children in the group. Mother supervised, mother was encouraged then to supervise him better and could do it uh, in the interactions with the cat and reminded him more supportively to let him know when he needed to go to the bathroom. Self-esteem is beginning uh, to be administrated from within at this point in this first year of preschool though the loving approval of reasonably idealized, idealizable parents is needed. And again, if the idealization of the parent as a normal part of super-ego development is absent because of losses, tragedies, um, attacks by medical personnel that have to be undertaken, um, absences, parental illnesses and so on, uh, if the idealization, de-idealization is too abrupt, uh, parental love will not compensate for giving up the gratifications of his impulses and provide him with the self-esteem or give him a sense of accomplishment. Uh, the child will not give up uh, or control impulses out of love and a wish for approval, but may feel that conformity is a loss of power and a surrender, a passive surrender. Mm -hmm. The stage is now set for an internalized, closed loop in the three-year-old. Guilt can begin to be a signal. Uh, let me remind you uh, that before this, You'd feel guilty after you did it, but you really didn't have the signal of, you know, you're going to feel bad if you do pull that cat's tail. All you can do is pull the cat's tail and then go around muttering, I'm bad, I'm bad. But eventually there becomes a loop where the superego will give you a clue that in fact you're going to feel bad if you do it. And that's when you begin to develop a child that promise enough to become a school child, to go to school without mom. Uh, at least the preschooler, to socialize. Uh, and the conscience begins to be able to tell that child, control yourself, 
or feel, you'll feel bad about yourself. Control yourself and you'll feel good about yourself. Um, when loving socialization has not occurred, and I was like a child that we have had years back in our preschool, uh, nearly four, uh, what you get is no close loop. Ricky, a child some years back in our three-year-old group, going on four, uh, would snatch a toy from another child, biting him to make it let go. And that was very old to be biting and shoving and pushing. And when asked by our head teacher, a genius with small children, I don't know why he couldn't ask for it. He said, but I wanted it. Uh, the teacher remarked to me later, something's wrong here. Uh, why was it when I pointed out to Ricky, we couldn't just grab other people's toys? Uh, he didn't get upset at all. And her memory was that every other child, when reprimanded, even in her most tactful way, would still get very upset and cry and try to resist the pain inside. Not this child. It was because I wanted it. Uh, it was odd to her that he didn't get upset at all. The other children would have. Ricky really didn't have a voice inside to externalize. The rules were someone else's, and there were no rules inside to externalize. The usual three-year-old in the negative Oedipal phase, no, big term, negative, Oedipal phase, is attracted to the same-sex idealized object. I use the word object. It's a psychoanalytic parlance for humans, human relationships. Um, and it's well, he or she should, because the identification and the wish for interactions with the same-sex parent is critical to their eventual identifications as male, or female, or feminine masculine. And this is part of what will become the ego ideal, these identifications with masculinity, feminine, and entity roles and values. Um, so this three to four year old is solidifying their sense of masculinity or femininity with their identifications, etc. Gradually this attraction is complicated so attraction to same-sex parent is complicated with the push to own the opposite sex parent, creating confusion and great inconsistencies in superego function. Guilt now, uh, not so much from the projected uh, externalized object, but in response to an inner institution, is experience. It's still externalized uh, to avoid the pain fairly often, but you see it much more as a closed loop, that the child can be sad and tolerate the pain. The five-year-old boy, uh, oh, this is the example that is, is so colorful and so true, uh, of the five-year-old boy who is enjoying feeling like mama's mean man during the day. But when daddy gets home, his beloved daddy, uh, you will see him get very provocative, provocative as though he's seeking a swap from dad to relieve his conscience, because the swap from dad to behave yourself would be less painful than the guilt. Uh, that's about where they are at five. Uh, wishful fantasies of being mom's main squeeze, or the little girl's fantasies of being the one to give daddy a baby, uh, are met with perceived rejection in incipient humiliation. Now, families don't purposely humiliate their little ones, uh, but the child's cognition is growing and he recognizes, gee, I'm probably not going to win this one, uh, and I wouldn't want to because I do love my daddy or I do love my mom. These are a touchy bunch of children, uh, sometimes exuding you know, the air of what we call the wounded mess cook. Somebody didn't like the food. Um, they're very touchy. Um, and the boys may imagine 
retaliatory hostility and attack, um, which we describe in psychoanalytic parlance as castration anxiety, since their highly valued genital organ is now experiencing pleasure with ethical fantasies. Um, girls may fear attack and abandonment by their moms for their wishes to replace her. They, of course, don't wish to replace their mother entirely, but there are times when they would like to be goddess men's kids. The triple threat of bodily harm, narcissistic injury, you know, I'm mortified because I'm just little, and loss of love solidifies the internal watchdog of the superego. And of course, this is the era of boo-boos. They have big boxes of band-aids uh, in the older nursery school. And uh, we recognize a lot more nightmares are occurring, and these are classic nightmares uh, of, of interagency conflict, where monsters are after you, and they may be internal conscience uh, representatives after you, the monster that's out there to, to uh, get you in your dreams may in fact be your own conscience or your projection uh, of retaliation. Uh, and we often uh, can hear this in the nightmares. Interestingly, late four, at the ages of late four years or so, the children's cognition has advanced, and they began to realize that others can't read their minds. Now, this occurred to me as I was looking at lines of development, thinking, well, what would I like to talk about? Well, you know, just about the time you got an internal conscience that's a closed loop, that'll give you a signal, I'm going to make you feel bad, it's just about the time you realize that your therapist, or your mother, or your teacher can't read your mind. How convenient that you now have a closed loop to control yourself. Um, this is, of course, a great time for secrets. And if you ask a five-year-old, say, who's coming home from kindergarten, what did you do today at school? You will eventually get the response, nothing. Uh, because now they can keep a secret. I can keep a secret what I did at nursery school. They're just playing with a new notion. But they also know closed loop conscience. Uh, this is just at the time when the superego, as I say, is largely internalized. Uh, and the child now identifies with his own moral code, increasing his self-esteem and self-control. Uh, guilt becomes a signal, as I say, a function that can stop the impulses so that the child is spared the pain of a rather fierce and black and white uh, superego that I described as the sort of the miserable conscience of the Bastille with a bread, you should go to the Bastille. Um, the child fears now loss of the love of his own conscience. The infantile neurosis is now in place as the origins of uh, internalized conflict, punishment, and sources of self-esteem at least. Uh, at least it's mostly internalized. Uh, the superego is still ruthlessly rigid. Uh, the teacher's pencil and so on. Uh, the layers of moral dilemma will build as they go. Uh, it's again, it's the era of real nightmares, uh, with agency conflict erupting in beings. It's the era of phobias. We could talk about phobias if there were time. Uh, and the preoccupation of injury and retaliation. In our four to five year old nursery, uh, a little girl, Casey, was stealing somebody else's transition logic that still was being brought to school. Uh, and the child was still teasing about stealing this teddy bear. Uh, and while we had watched this child try to tune in on what he was doing to or she was doing to other children and see the affects. Uh, the most effective building tool for this child really was pointing out to her, you know, you'll feel much better inside if you don't tease Sarah by taking her beer. And it works best. 
because after all, that kind of feedback is what will keep us honest. Okay, so by the end of the ethical period, the superhero has become a mostly closed loop, warning, punishing, but praising, and offering quiet satisfaction. Uh, you can begin to see that the child is getting satisfaction out of doing the right thing, whether anybody sees it or not. Uh, yes, it's very fluid, and uh, under stress it will be externalized. Uh, but by and large, it's providing considerable autonomy uh, to our children. In fact, most societies, ancient or modern, uh, and without the benefit of child psychology or psychoanalysis, never considered any form of schooling uh, until the children in the culture were about the age of six. Interesting, huh? And when the child has better inner controls, and can tolerate being one of many, and can focus on formal instruction. Interesting parallels in development include a decrease in idealization of the parents. And these are just things to think about because they're so interesting to study. Uh, the five or six year old finds that the lady down the street is in fact a better cook than the mother. And that other kids have bigger houses, or their dads have bigger cars in the driveway. The family romance comes into play. Uh, we don't have time to talk about the family romance, but it's a study of great interest that has to do with child's literature and the learning of the elementary school years. Uh, but the family romance uh, is, is a creation in the child's mind that helps them with the disappointment that they, in fact, do not have the grandest parents in the world. Um, and it soothes the angst of this de-idealization. If you study children's literature, for example, think about the latest craze uh, for elementary school children, uh, the Harry Potter books. Mm -hmm. Think about Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Such grand, magical parents killed by Voldemort. And think of the family he was dropped into. Oh, how ordinary were the Dursleys, or worse. Um, Famous children's books like Sarah Crew and Heidi are still favorites. The classics almost always have this family romance theme in them. Um, ego ideals begin to emerge at the start of a consolidation that will not end with young adulthood, uh, or will not end until young adulthood, and probably never end. Uh, little girls in early latency are bossy versions of their mothers as they get their internalization straight. And boys demanding their backpacks are versions of dad's briefcase, as they imagine going off to work. They're beginning to settle mm -hmm. their Oedipal mm -hmm. wishes and longings and make the proper identification. I, I'll mention a little more about latency in the second lecture. But I think I would stop there for now. Decentralizing, you know, this notion that we have to assume certain gender roles. So I'm just wondering, from a psychoanalytic perspective, you know, what your thoughts are. About yeah, I, I think psychoanalysis has gotten blasted. And, you know, developmental psychoanalysis really is information on the basis of observation. And it certainly is not talking about identifications of stereotypic roles. I mean, one identifies with their mother because their femininity, if they're a little girl, needs to be solidified that being a girl is wonderful. If you have a mother who doesn't like being a girl, mm -hmm. it's going to be very difficult to be happy with yourself. Uh -huh. And we are talking about the functions of the mother 
Well, the mother's function could be to be a physician. Huh? Or it could be, you know, to be an airline mechanic. It could be anything. But the basic functions of being a woman have to be made. That's very interesting. Some of my friends who were uh, 30 years ago when they were all having children or more um, were very big feminists at the time. And their little girls never saw them in a dress, ever. Uh, and never saw them sort of hyper feminine in any way. And they got to their first day of kindergarten wanting to wear really dresses and black pad leather shoes. <laughs> Drove their mothers nuts. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. They're just solidifying their identity as girls. This too will pass. And by the age of six, those kids were in slacks again. And they didn't get into a dress till they got married. Uh, so I think it's not a rigid version of, okay, you be ladylike and you be masculine. It pulls from many areas of identification. But the final bottom line is, I enjoy being a girl. It's got to be conveyed to others. Mm -hmm. I enjoy being a girl mechanic. I enjoy being a girl doctor. I enjoy being a whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, you know, it reminded me. <clears throat> it's a wonderful model. It's a model that course, the Novics were trained in uh, London with Santa Foy. And that's the model that I brought to Annapolis, and I'm glad to see that uh, it's a after well. I left, I developed it again <laughs> in the nursery school, because as you remember, we had the World Heavy Clinic, several toilet groups, two nursery schools for children, and we were observing people from the moment of pregnancy, which is what was done in London. Yes. Now, let me uh, make a couple of comments. Because, as you say, there are many lines that are related to uh, superego development. And clearly, a superego is the only a structure that is acquired. And it's very different from uh, one human being to another, from one culture to another, from the set of values of any given culture to another. So that in some places, I don't know, in uh, old times, cannibalism was legitimate, because as unheard of uh, in our culture. That was a normal part of the people on being normal at that particular point. In Hansen, we had a lot of opportunities to look at a large number of children of all ages. And uh, we saw the enormous, because the superego is an interactional phenomenon between the kid the ego and the external world, and it has to be built, and you have to take the model from the outside and so on. We saw all kind of uh, interesting things. For example, the degree of cleverness of the child, how gifted his ego was, is a knife with two edges. As you well know from observing, let's say, uh, obsession of patients that, generally speaking, have very precocious ego, mm -hmm. which means they are aware of the external demand very early and introject. Mm -hmm. Beef, though gifted as they are, they introject very early, which means they don't have a, like a blank card for a while to let the drive rain without guilt. Yeah. They, in fact, absorb the prohibitions much earlier than they should, and that leads to the severity of the superego that they do have. On the other hand, those children that are not as gifted uh, as the precocious ego obsessional kids were, can go through phases like the one you described where they behave appallingly and let the, the drive rain free and really don't have much of a protest anywhere except from the external world, which of course is working in building the superior. That's why it is interactional. But it takes time and they get away with a lot of things without creating a conflict because it is permissible at that point, given the balance of the structures that they are building in the head. But I never forget that once we were very uh, taken by observing children in latency, 
that had chewing difficulties. They couldn't chew anything. I have mentioned this to the students here before. <clears throat> and we were very puzzled by that. But what is this? I mean, these six, seven, eight years old children that had to, they couldn't eat anything that needed to be chewed. No meat, no, nothing that needed to be chewed. Everything had to be liquefied. So we did a study. We put these children together <clears throat> and we look at them. And I mention it because it shows how early precursors of the superego can be interjected and become operative and permanently operative in these children. We look at these children and we found something that was common in all of them. They all have been breastfed and they all were weaned suddenly. All right, and so we say, well, that's the answer. They were weaned suddenly. Uh, you know, that obviously was somewhat traumatic to them and so on. Only that, unfortunately, we then found a large number of the same children that have been weaned suddenly, you know, from the breast and didn't have, had not developed the, the chewing inhibition. So we had to go back to the board again and look again. Mm -hmm. So we did that for a long time and were puzzled like you wouldn't believe. We were thinking of all kinds of possibilities. None of them uh, kind of uh, sustained the passage of time. They were proved wrong by another child or, uh, you know, a number of other observations. So on, until we finally found the answer, which was very interesting. These mothers of the children that had developed it had cannibalistic fantasies. And they had won these children when they started to tease because they did buy that the breast and that created a significant problem because they can damage obviously you know the breast real badly and it's very painful and so on and so these mothers win the children now they did that not because it was painful that was a factor obviously but the main factor was that they had cannibalistic fantasies themselves that were reactivated by the child biting and the project, and that terrified them. And so they had a reaction which was out of proportion, you know, to the incidents that were taking place. And they, it was not the winning suddenly, it was a reaction of the mother to the cannibalistic fantasies that led. And that was somewhat conveyed to the children. This was between the ages of six and nine months because it generally happened once the children develop teeth, which doesn't happen before six months of age. Before that time, some children have a tendency to try to bite, but they don't hurt because they don't have teeth. And so it was remarkable that they have interjected that as a severe so prohibition good. that led to an inhibition of chewing that lasted all through latency. And for some <coughs> people, may well last all through their life, and yet it was acquired at, at six months of age. Which poses the interesting question always of um, how does the introjects that are acquired before the ego is capable of processing the events in, and modulating it so as to create a superego that is somewhat more flexible, reasonable, and amenable to transactions and negotiation. How important these things are. In other words, what you were saying earlier, that the events in this first few years of life, even in the first year of life, may leave an impression Forever, I never forgot this uh, group of children that we studied that had that inhibition. That until we got to the fant cannibalistic fantasies of the mother, that were very obvious and terrified them because the children reactivated it by their biting. That that led to an early introject that lasted for years, which means they created a prohibition that was active and has the strength to be imposed from that moment onwards, all through latency, you know, it's, it's really very interesting. The superego obviously is uh, one of these structures that is very rewarding if you have opportunity of observing children in this age group, because that is when it gets mm -hmm. developed. The truth is 
that by the age of five or six is already there in its essentials, and it will change some, obviously, as we grow older, but essentially the structure is there and it's not easily modifiable any longer. So that's a wonderful... Have you written that? Have you made a paper out of that? I haven't made a paper out of it yet. Well, you should write it as a paper because it's a wonderful description <laughs> of, of these uh, processes. It's yeah. probably the best one I ever heard. You should write it as a paper and have it published, really. I, I would they, like... Because it's, it's just so critical. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think the statement, it takes a lot of nerve to say it, but once it's done, you're done wrong, you don't get that. Yeah. Uh, you can make individuals that comply as long as there's a cop in the corner. Mm -hmm. Well, in truth, there's a quantity of stories that jump on it. You, know, you should write it. Thanks very much. We uh, take a little break and in another 15-20 minutes we go to puberty, which should be as rewarding as this one was.